once again I am back to talk about books that I read in quarantine. This time sporting some recklessly chopped bangs that I did cut myself in the bathroom mirror at 5 in the morning. I don't want to talk about it. Today I'm going to be talking about all of the series that I've read in quarantine. I'm going to divide these up into great series, okay, good series, and the truly terrible ones that I have read. So if you want to hear me talk shit, I guess stick around. Of course, I'm back with my book log because I truly don't go anywhere without it. Um, it's going to help me remember what I read this quarantine and how I felt about it. First, I wanted to say that I love a good book series. And if that's not your thing, that's totally fine. Maybe this video is not for you. What I like about a book series is that we really get a chance to dive into these characters and to follow them through multiple different scenarios, see how they develop over a period of time. Um, there's just so much more room to explore. While I love a good standalone book, I've noticed that the series are the ones that get the most fandom hype, you know? These are the ones where people are cosplaying as the characters. These are the ones that sometimes get movie franchises. I mean, this is where this is where the excitement happens. This is where the community really wants to be, I think. Here are the rules. I'm going to talk about the series that I started in quarantine and perhaps finished in quarantine or um, did my best to finish in quarantine, shall we say. And I'm going to be talking about things that I didn't talk about in my last video. So um, I know last time I mentioned A Darker Shade of Magic. So even though that's a, a series I started and finished in quarantine, um, we're going to talk about other things. Let's go. It's one of my favorite books that I've read in quarantine. It just so happens that a couple of these series were rereads for me. So they're a series that I've lived with for a long time. Um, and then just decided to go back to in quarantine because it had been a while. One of those series, I'm sure lots of you will know, is the Percy Jackson series. Mm. For any of you non-Percy stands out there, um, A, you're missing out, um, and B, this is a middle grade series that follows the children of the mythological Greek gods in modern times as they you know, attend a camp, a training camp called Camp Half-Blood and go to school and fight monsters and, you know, try not to die. Our main character, Percy Jackson, is the son of Poseidon. Um, and he sort of begins very new to camp, um, very new to the whole world of demigods and um, mythology. And then you get to see him sort of grow up into his mid-teens, um, you know. <laughs> I decided to reread the story because um, Rick Riordan, the author of these books, announced that they would be coming out with a new uh, TV series on Disney+. Plus. He's writing the script or he has more creative control. This is huge news for Percy Jackson fans because um, they did try to make a movie, a Percy Jackson movie. I think actually they made two and they were awful. They were really bad and they didn't capture the spirit of the book at all. In rereading it, you know, I remembered what I liked about them so much. They're really quirky. I mean, it's like there are situations that these characters get into that are totally absurd because the mythology is totally absurd. And Uncle Rick really leans into that with his writing style. There's also a great community at the heart of these books. You know, the characters that you don't really like at the beginning, um, like Clarice, really come around and become some of your favorite characters by the end of the series. It's a series that deals with growing up and, you know, finding your place in the world, um, living up to other people's expectations of you or choosing to live up to your own expectations, which I think is very appropriate for the audience that Rick is trying to reach. And as someone who first read these books way back, it must have been 13, 14, something like that, um, and then revisiting them as an adult, like, I kind of appreciate that that charm hasn't gone away. The books are still funny and charming, um, even though they're aimed towards children. 
I really recommend that you read the Percy Jackson series if you haven't already, especially if you have a young person in your life and you want to share this with them. Or if you've already read the series, I suggest a reread to get ready for the Disney Plus uh, TV show that's going to come out soon. And yes, my next project is to read uh, The Heroes of Olympus, which is another series by Rick Riordan um, and a spinoff of the Percy Jackson series. I'm so excited! Okay, moving on. Mm. Mm. Another series that I reread in quarantine um, that had a huge, huge formative influence on my uh, early teens was uh, Libba Bray's Gemma Doyle series. I love her so much. For those of you that watched my last video, you may have already heard me talk about Libba Bray because I was talking about her Diviners series, the last book of which came out this year. But Libba's first series follows this young woman named Gemma Doyle who lives in the 1890s and attends a ladies finishing school in England. Libba might be my favorite author. My favorite author of all time. I don't care if it's YA, if it's for children, like whatever. Like she, her stories are so magical and the characters are so personal and flawed and people that you feel like you really know. And most importantly, all of her books hinge on a message of um, making the world a better place and um, dismantling privilege. Anyway, I just adore her books, and when I finished the Diviners series, of course I had to go back into her archive and reread Gemma Doyle. I made my sister reread it too. Um, she liked it, I think. <laughs> this book is all about witches and the occult and covens and secret plots, you know, um, things that go on in ladies' finishing schools. Our main cast of characters are these four girls, these four young women, um, just on the verge of sort of coming out into society. We have Gemma, who is obviously our main character. She's the new girl. She's got a mysterious past um, and some secrets, I guess you could say. We've got Pippa, who's sort of the belle of the ball. She's known for being very beautiful. Um, her mother wants her to get engaged to a wealthy man um, and she might have her own ideas about how she wants to live her life. Then we have Anne. Anne, I adore Anne. Doesn't come from a wealthy family. She doesn't expect to make a good marriage. Um, she's sort of destined to become a governess, but she's also got this incredibly talented singing voice. She wants to sort of have her moment in the sun, just like the rest of her friends. And then there's Felicity, badass Felicity, who doesn't take shit from anyone. She's super wealthy. She's absolutely spoiled. She kind of knows how to get her own way, how to manipulate the situation, and you kind of love her for it. There's a very cute love interest boy who was one of my first crushes, one of my first fictional crushes, I should say. If you have a young girl in your life, you know, early teenage years, maybe preteen years, or even, you know, mid-teens, like, get them these books, because that's the perfect time to read them. They'll make you laugh, they'll make you cry, they'll make you fall in love, um, and sort of contemplate the choices that you have, or think you might not have, but actually secretly do have. It's a story about young women reacting against the sort of constraints of the expectations on them and the sort of narrow way that they're expected to lead their lives. Maybe one of these days I'll do a whole video on Libba Bray's books. I love her! Libba, if you're watching this, I think you're amazing. Yeah, like I just think these books need more hype. I want to, you know, I want to compare themes across books and motifs and I don't know. Ugh. New haircut. Whatever. Let's move on to a series that I read for the first time in quarantine and loved and it's now one of my favorites. I had been hearing about this book series forever. I had been told by so many people who I respect that it was 
one of the greatest that I had to read it. I don't know why it took me so long, um, but that is the Six of Crows duology by Leigh Bardugo. Mm. This is a high fantasy series that takes place in a fictional world called the Grishaverse. Um, it is a spin-off of another series by the same author, but I don't believe that you have to read Shadow and Bone before you read The Six of Crows. Um, I certainly didn't, and I, I still enjoyed it. This series follows a cast of six characters um, who absolutely pass the phone book rule. By the way, if you guys don't know what the phone book rule is, it's a rule that I use, you know, to decide if I like a group of characters or not. Basically, if I were to sit in a room with these characters and all we were doing was reading from a phone book or doing like the most boring menial task imaginable, um, would I actually enjoy myself just because of the personalities in the room? I'd have fun reading from a phone book with these characters. I would watch them do it just because I, uh, because they're so funny and interesting and the way they play off one another is great. Okay, so our six characters in the first book, they have to um, go on a heist and, and steal a very precious thing from a very secure area. Um, and while the heist plot certainly keeps you on your toes, is always so engaging, I really think it's the characters that drive this one. In the second book, Crooked Kingdom, um, that's really where the characters get to shine. I don't know. I don't know what more to say. I feel like so much has been said about this book, especially on um, the booktube community. It's still technically YA, but I certainly think it's more adult than say like Percy Jackson. So it might be a good thing to crack open, crack, ugh. it might be a good thing to crack open if um, that's kind of what you're into. This is the kind of series where people gush over the characters. Okay, now I want to get to some series that I enjoyed middlingly that I read in quarantine. The first one is Saba Tahir's An Ember in the Ashes. What can I say about this series? This is another one of those that some of my favorite booktubers really hyped up. It really seemed like this was a must read for me. Um, it takes place in a fantasy world with uh, lots of different cultures and you know big sprawling maps, all of that stuff that I really enjoy. And then I read the first book and I just, mm, I was kind of underwhelmed by the first book, I have to say. It really felt very cliche to me, like all of the plot points were stuff I'd already read. You know, it deals with slavery and war and oppression and genocide and all of these really really dark topics and then I felt because of that it was so clear you know who the bad guys were and who the good guys were. I guess what I'm saying is it was really black and white thinking and of course when you're dealing with topics like genocide you know you can't go gray area on the genocidal people, right? Like, no, obviously they're bad guys. But then if the main characters themselves are so kind of idealized, it just gets hard to watch them struggle so much. You know what I mean? Anyway, I didn't enjoy the first book, but because I had heard so much about the series and people really seemed to love it and I felt like I was maybe missing something, I decided to read the second book. Um, a Torch Against the Night. Like, like, it was one of my favorite books that I've read all year. Like, it was so good. And I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why I didn't like the first one, but then I read the second one and I really enjoyed the second one. I think the second one um, involved more espionage, more hiding in dark corners and stuff. And it wasn't always clear who you could trust, who was on your side. You know, there was so much more intrigue, right? Because it wasn't so black and white. The relationships between the main characters were certainly developed further. Um, my favorite character, Helene, uh, really got to stand on her own and have her own shining moment, which is, mm, that's all I really want, you know? And then I read the third book, um, A Reaper at the Gates, which I also thought was good. Um, I didn't like it as much as A Torch Against the Night, but still very good. And the last book comes out this year. 
So a lot of people love this series. Um, there are good reasons to love this series. I think if you want to take a crack at it, be my guest. You know, just know that it's dealing with a lot of high fantasy elements and you know the first book isn't the strongest one in the series. And I'm really looking forward to what Saba Tahir has for us in the final book of the series. Another series I read that I say I enjoyed middlingly was the Charlotte Holmes series by uh, Brittany Cavallaro. Cavallaro. Anyway, this is a mystery series that follows the great something grandchildren of Sherlock Holmes and Jamie Watson um, as they sort of try to solve mysteries you know, around their school. This series is like a late teens, young adult-ish series. There's a lot of references to the story of Sherlock Holmes and, and his mysteries and everything. It's a nice add-on to anyone who's already a fan of Sherlock Holmes. I felt that the mysteries that were leading the story were kind of lackluster. You know, they certainly, they weren't like, gripping you at the end of your seat, making you run through every possible scenario, you know? It felt like the thing that was really driving these stories ahead was the relationship between uh, Charlotte Holmes and Jamie Watson, right? Because a lot of the series is actually from Jamie's point of view. So, you know, he's the one who's always looking out for his Holmes, um, making sure that she eats, that she doesn't do drugs. Um, I guess maybe that's a, one of the things I liked about the series actually is that, you know, Charlotte Holmes sort of embodies a lot of the like manic genius things that Sherlock Holmes does in his series, except it's portrayed as like actually toxic and bad for her. And she actually has to go to therapy and get some help for it. And like, I think that's good. <laughs> Sherlock probably needs that too. Again, the mysteries weren't as gripping or as intriguing as I wanted them to be, but the book really holds together by the way that these two characters sort of relate to one another and how they support each other or sometimes even let each other down. Like, this book really takes you on a whole journey with them. So if you're into Sherlock Holmes, this is a good thing to pick up. Anyway, so another series that I liked and recommend is um i read a couple series by sarah mclean sarah mclean is a regency romance author i love regency romance um i read her love by number series and the bare knuckle bastards but i haven't finished the bare knuckle bastards because that book just came out and i put a hold on it at the library i think sarah mclean just happens to write some of the greatest like examples of the genre of Regency romance that are out there. Um, I have a hard time recommending romance novels to people because either you connect with them or you don't, you know? And if you don't, like, totally fine. It's not your jam. The romance genre is very formulaic. Pretty much the same plot every book you read. And sometimes I read them and I just don't connect with the characters and they're like, they're really bad. Sarah McLean happens to be an author where pretty much everything I read by her is kind of a win. Like, it just, it just works for me. I think she takes a lot of time to really round out her characters, make them interesting, explain to us why they do what they do. She doesn't rely on sort of shorthands for like, this is a badass woman or like, this is a shy wallflower. Like, no, she creates three dimensional characters. And that, that's, that's all I really want. Literally, why do I read books? Probably just so I can meet interesting people. And it's my cross to bear, I suppose, that none of these people are real, except in my imagination. And the imagination of hundreds of thousands of people. Anyway, these are definitely adult romance, not PG-13. Um, you know, if Regency romance is your thing, I recommend Sarah McLean's series to y'all. All right, now it's time for me to divulge the worst series that I've read in quarantine. I want it to be said that I will forgive a lot. <laughs> I go into a book series wanting to enjoy it, expecting to enjoy it. 
I don't think I'm too critical. And you know, in the case of Ember and the Ashes, I didn't like the first one, but I gave it another try, went for the second one, and really ended up liking the series as a whole. When I say a series is bad, you can take my word for it. The first one is Victoria Schwab's Our Savage Song duology. Oh! I know that there are people that are heartbroken that I'm saying this because it's a very popular series by a very popular author. Victoria Schwab also wrote the Darker Shade of Ma Magic trilogy that I really enjoyed. But this series was, I just don't even know. Okay, the first one, Our Savage Song. Um, it was about these high school students who lived in like a city where that was populated by like magical monsters and things that would like eat you and stuff. These two children from these rival families basically end up meeting and um, a lot of shit goes down and they have to run away and take care of each other and yeah. I liked the first book. I felt like it was a good introduction to what could have been a good series. You know, I felt like the relationships could have been developed more, but it made sense because, you know, they were like running for their lives and encountering new obstacles. So there wasn't a whole lot of time for them to like explore their relationships and stuff. Everything was so, you know. I was really looking forward to the second book because I was like, this is a chance for them to really talk about what they mean to one another um, and help save their city and create a better world. But that's not what happened. By the way, when I say what they mean to one another, I didn't actually read their relationship as romantic. It felt more brother-sister to me, but apparently the author didn't think so. But the second book was so... I don't know who edited this book. I don't know who allowed this to be published. Like, it was so full of plot cul-de-sacs that just didn't take us anywhere. We just went round and round thinking about one thing, only for it to, like, really not fizzle into anything. The second book adds a new point of view character. Um, in the first book they were alternating between our two main characters, chapters, one chapter would be from her point of view, one chapter would be from his. We had this third character and I thought, oh, like this is going to, we're gonna like learn something about him. He's supposed to be the main villain, right? We're gonna learn something about him, we're gonna figure out his plot. We're gonna somehow take this guy who seems like so despicably evil and, you know, add a little gray to his image. Um, no, that's not what we did. The chapters from this character's point of view, half of the time he was just trying to hunt down women to murder because they kind of looked like his, like, stepdaughter or whatever. Ew. Ew, 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 ew! Like, it was so grotesque, and I kept thinking, like, what is the point? Like, are we learning something from this, or are we just showing these graphic images, or depicting these graphic images for... what? Because it's gory and ugh, I didn't, I didn't like it at all. Yeah, like, when you meet a ton of new characters at the beginning of the novel, this whole other society, this whole other city, and it seems like they really care about one another and they're gonna develop this plot line. Gone by chapter two, never to be heard from again. I just didn't get it. I just didn't understand what's the point. You know, they set up rivalries, nemeses that are gonna come to blows at some point, um, but then they just don't. Like, it's like Game of Thrones, right? It's like, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, wouldn't it be great if so-and-so got to defeat Cersei? And who ends up defeating Cersei? A brick wall? <laughs> Like, it's absurd. It's absurd. I was so angry when I read this. Um, complete waste of time. I don't know why people like this series. I couldn't, I couldn't get behind it. I couldn't. Speaking of series that I couldn't get behind, the other series that I read, that I actually had to stop halfway through the last novel and like didn't read the last two chapters because I just couldn't deal with it anymore was um, the Defy the Stars trilogy by Claudia Gray. Look, I picked up this series because I follow very popular booktuber Reads with Cindy and I saw that it was on her Goodreads, you know, and she 
said it was kind of a sweet space science fiction romance, and it was. I liked the first book. I even liked the second book, but it was the last book, the third one, where I just couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. It follows a young woman named Noemi, who is from a planet where, you know, it's trying to defend itself and its culture against the sort of intergalactic order, right? Then there is Abel, who is an android, a super advanced android, um, who looks and acts human, but is a machine. They are on opposite sides of this war. They end up sort of being pushed together on the spaceship and have to go on a mission to save both their lives. They end up learning things about one another, discussing what it means to be human, and um, it does get kind of develop into a romance. Again, I didn't really find the romance here all that interesting. Like, I didn't see a lot of the chemistry. It was far more interesting to me that they became friends when they had so many disagreements and so many um, forces kind of pulling them apart. Here's the thing, though. The whole book series, Noemi makes decisions that are guided by her principles. She's a very religious person. She believes that human life is precious um, and must be preserved. She comes to believe that Abel has a soul, despite the fact that he is a machine, that because he can feel emotion, because he can dream, you know, she comes to realize that he is a person she also comes from a culture that believes that, um, that there is an afterlife, that life on earth is very temporary, and that how one chooses to live their life should be really up to them. Enter the third book. I guess this is a spoiler. So like, if you really don't wanna be spoiled, like, I guess skip ahead, but I'm just gonna talk about it. So here's what happens. In the end of the second book, um, Noemi gets a fatal gunshot wound, right? But Abel, because he's in love with her, clearly is devastated and wants her to live. So he like freezes her body and basically decides to give her an androidification surgery, you know, like, rewire her brain and shit with machine parts. It's very clear throughout the series that Noemi is not afraid of death, believes in an afterlife, wants to, wants to die a heroic death, right? And she does, and then Abel says, nope, literally reprograms her, right? Her body is changed. Her mind is changed. She wakes up from the surgery and she is alive, but she's like a completely different person. We need to talk about body consent, okay? Okay, because if you knew enough of a person to know that they'd want the switch pulled, they'd want the life plug pulled, you know, like you gotta respect their wishes. Abel literally just made a decision for this woman and it was like a, like a massive decision. I want her to wake up and be like, I can't trust you because you did this to me. You literally reprogrammed me. No, you know what she does? She wakes up, she's getting used to her new body and she's rightfully frightened and a little bit like concerned and is like, oh, and by the way, now she's immortal. So, you know, she believes in an afterlife. She believes she's gonna be able to reunite with her dead friend. But now she's denied that because she's a machine. Okay, so she's getting used to her new body um, and sort of dealing with the fact that she's now a completely different person. And Abel's like, oh, I bet you think that you're less of a human now that you're a machine. That must mean that you don't really love me. <laughs> and then she's like, no, no, it's just, I'm just getting used to it. It's actually not your fault, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, no, girl. Like. That was not okay. I'm sorry, but your boyfriend, no matter what kind of android genius he is, shouldn't have to make decisions for you. And some might argue, well, he saved her life. It's like, no, he completely altered her life. I know the other option was death, but like, again, 
based on everything we know about this character, that death wouldn't have been necessarily something that she didn't want. You know, ah, I just couldn't deal with it. And then like Abel's victimization, like, oh, well, if you don't like your new body, then you must not like my machine body. And she was like, this isn't even about you, dude. Like, why do we do this? Like authors, seriously, why? Like, why do we depict these horrible, awful things being done to female characters um, to further the like character development of the man? Why do we do that? I can't get behind it. I really can't. I don't want to read it. I don't want to hear about it. Um, and if it happens, fine. You know, say it actually was integral to the plot. Okay, then can we fully unpack that for a second? Can we absolutely condemn the men who are doing this to these women? I had to stop reading that one because that's when it jumped the shark for me. Like, A, that you even depict, you know, a life-altering medical procedure given to someone without their consent and then you portray it as the person who's really the victim in all of this is the surgeon oh man <laughs> is the boyfriend you know like ah like no fuck you she didn't consent to that she didn't consent to that i would have thrown the whole man away the whole man is in the trash now i don't want it Anyway, those are the those are the series that I read in quarantine. If you have any recommendations for me, please let me know in the comments. I would love to hear them. Have you read any of these series? Did you like them? Did you hate them? Do you agree with me? And what would you like for me to talk about next? Um, I'm still here, living in someone else's apartment. Well, wow. Anna, Anna. That's all she wrote, my friends. Um, I guess we'll take us out to some pretty plants. Some say the world will end in a fire. Some say in ice. When the sun begins to expand, there's no time.